Welcome to session three of the Aurox Conference on Microscopy. I hope that you've managed to attend a couple of the other sessions. Um, we've had a brilliant morning so far, um, hence why we've overrun by some margin. Some of the talks were really interesting, so we didn't want to cut them short. But thank you for your patience. Um, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about our Unity all-in-one benchtop confocal. Um, so it's an exciting new product that's been launched recently at Aurox, and we, we really are excited to tell you all about it. Um, so this talk is going to be um, for about 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief history of our company, just in case you don't know who Aurox is. And then I'm going to give you a little run through about how our technology works. Uh, I'll give you an introduction to the Aurox Unity Confocal and show you a few example data sets that we've collected over the last few months. Um, then there'll be a brief pause in the middle while I change my microphone and camera to a different angle, and then I'll go ahead and show you a live demo of the system. So to give you a brief history of Aurox as the company, some of you may have heard of us before, um, but for some of you, it may be a new introduction to our team. So we're a, we're a small company based in Oxfordshire in the UK. Um, and we have a, a, a very uh, prestigious uh, board of directors. So we have four co-founders of the company, um, some of whom have been talking at this conference. So if you if you manage to um, see some of their talks, they really gave some great insight into uh, uh, the objective lens, how to measure resolution, and also uh, insights into super resolution technology. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have Dr. Remus Strasgatis, who's here actually with me at the moment. Um, so for over 20 years, he was part of the Scanning Optical Microscopy Group at the Department of Engineering Science in Oxford University, where he developed a number of advanced optical microscopy techniques, pioneering the use of fiber optics, laser feedback, and structured illumination. Um, and he's a head of our research and development um, department here at Aurox, and he's um, uh, been developing and designing all of our laser-free confocal technology. We also have Tony Wilson, um, who's also on our board of directors and a co-founder. Uh, Tony is general editor of the Journal of Microscopy and a former president of the Royal Microscopical Society and also past master of the Worshipful Com Company of Scientific Instrument Makers. Um, he's won numerous awards and prize, prizes over the years and again uh, was instrumental in the design of our, of our instruments. We have Professor Martin Booth. Um, Martin is a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford, based jointly at the Centre for Neural Circuits and Behaviour at the Department of Engineering Science. Um, his research interests include development of new technology from microscopy and photonic engineering. Um, he spoke a little bit earlier about some super resolution techniques. He also works on adaptive optics and helps us behind the scenes with the development of our technology and software. We also have Professor Mark Neal. Um, he's a professor in photonics at Imperial College London, where his research is concentrated on a wide range of imaging and microscopy techniques, including fluorescence microscopy um, and their application across multiple disciplines. Um, he was speaking earlier about um, how to measure resolution correctly on your confocal microscope and some of the considerations you might want to think about. Um, Mark helps us, uh, especially uh, developing new technology. He's an expert in electronics and software design. Um, so he's, he's working with Remas uh, very closely and was instrumental in some of the development of the Unity pro product. So as you see, we've got a really, really uh, knowledgeable uh, team behind our company. And that's allowed us to develop some really innovative technology over the years. So even if you haven't heard of Aurox before, um, we've been around for a long time now. So Aurox was founded in 2004 as a spin-out company from the University of Oxford Engineering Department. Um, and at that time, they developed a, a, an instrument called the OptiGrid, which you might have heard of, but it's on which the Zeiss Apatome is based. So this is the, the grid um, sectioning uh, method where you move a grid in a translation across your sample um, to get some sectioning. We then went on to work with Zeiss to develop the Zeiss Vivatome in about 2009 and we won an R&D 100 award for that for that product. Um, we then went on to work with Andor to develop the Revolution DSD range of um, optical sectioning 
spinning disk uh, systems. So there's the Revolution DSD-1 and the Revolution DSD-2. Um, we also worked with, uh, well, we still do work with a company called 3D Histech. So our technology is inside their panoramic confocal slide scanner. And also we still work with Zeiss on their SmartProof 5 confocal engine for materials analysis. But as you can see, up until about 2016, we were primarily an OEM um, manufacturer. manufacturer. Um, so we were making and designing products for other companies. So in 2017, when I joined the company, and also uh, Dr. Lee Reese, who's been uh, chairing a lot of the sessions and keeping this conference going behind the scenes, um, we both joined the company. And we started to sell um, our confocal products direct to end users and researchers like yourselves. So at that time, we relaunched our um, spinning disk laser-free confocal add-on as the Clarity LFC, um, which I spoke about yesterday. So the um, demonstration on that instrument is available if you click the registration link for session three yesterday. We also designed our own software, which is a really easy to use software package. Later on then, we developed a high-speed version of the Clarity called the Clarity HS. And more recently, we've launched our Unity all-in-one Confocal, which I'll be talking about today. So you might not um, realize that you don't need a laser to do confocal imaging. In fact, Tony Wilson, one of our founders, he did a, a very famous talk where he did a candlelight confocal uh, demonstration. So he showed that you could do optical sectioning just with a candle. So you don't necessarily need a strong and coherent laser light source to get this confocal imaging. So why would you choose a laser-free system? So all our systems are laser-free. We don't use lasers, although you could if you really wanted to. Um, we tend to use LED lights. This gives you a lower initial purchase price. The LED illuminators on the market are now very affordable. Um, and because we don't need big, bulky lasers, it means that our systems are very compact. They're also really easy to use, and you don't need any specific maintenance contracts. Um, there's no downtime. Um, LEDs are extremely stable and long-lived, so you, you really don't have to worry about routinely monitoring and replacing your light source. Also, without a laser to worry about, you don't have any safety restrictions, you don't have to interlock the doors, and you don't need to have any specific training. Anyone can pick up our instruments and use them. Also, because we have a laser-free and spinning disc device, um, our systems tend to be a lot gentler on your sample and you tend to get lower photo bleaching and lower phototoxicity, although this is a little bit sample dependent. So just to highlight how we can achieve um, confocal imaging without a laser, I'm just going to show on the next couple of slides and I'm more than happy to explain this in more detail later if anyone doesn't quite understand. <clears throat> so. If anyone's um, familiar with a traditional laser-based spinning disc system, um, when I say traditional, this is sort of the Nipkoff spinning disc design that you might find in a Yokogawa-based system. You'll see that there's a, a number of pinholes arranged around a disc. These pinholes don't let very much light through. And actually, when uh, Remus and his colleagues um, did a measurement back in the 2000s, um, they measured the light throughput of a traditional Nipkoff spinning disk and realized it was less than 1%. Now, this got a lot better over the last few years. And now a Nipkoff type spinning disk will have a light throughput of about 5 to 7%. But it's still very, very low. So you imagine that you're shining this very intense laser at this spinning disk and 95% of your instant light is just being reflected away and you're only getting 5% of your light reaching your sample. So that means they need the strong laser illumination to get any light to their sample at all. How we um, illuminate our sample, we have a, a disc, and instead of pinholes, we have this patented structured illumination pattern. It's like almost like a diffraction grating type pattern on the spinning disc. Now, this pattern is uh, arranged in a light, dark, light, dark uh, fashion. This means that 50% of the light will pass through the disc. So just looking at this, we can get 10 times the amount of light onto our sample, which means we don't need the strong illumination of the lasers. And you'll see when I do the live demonstration that we actually use very, very low LED power and very low exposure times as well, and um, because our, our system is so light efficient. 
So this schematic will just talk us through how we achieve laser-free focal. It's just having a grid pattern. Um, we have to do some clever things in the optics as well. Um, so this um, schematic is based on our clarity laser-free confocal system. However, the um, approach in the Unity laser-free confocal system is exactly the same. So we can assume that they're, they're working in the same way. So first of all, if you can see my cursor, which I'm not sure, but on the top left-hand side, we have a white light source. So as I say, primarily, we use an LED illuminator. Um, but you could, in fact, use a metal halide lamp, or this could be a laser as well, if you chose. So this white light source provides some excitation light. This will pass through an excitation filter within the system, so choose your wavelength of light, and it will pass through the spinning disk. Now, because it's passing through the pattern on the disk, that um, projects a grid pattern into the focal plane of your sample. Now, that's going to excite your fluorophores, and your fluorophores are going to emit their light. Now, at this point, the light will go back to the disk. Half of the light will pass through the disk. Um, and this light, we call the transmitted light, contains our confocal signal, but it also contains about 50% of the out of focus blurred light. And we project that onto, in the case of our clarity add on confocal, onto one half of a CMOS detector. And in the case of Unity, which I'll show you in, in, in a second, uh, onto one discrete uh, CMOS chip. So that's only half the story. So we've, we've rejected some of our out of focus light, but we still have a lot of blur in the system. So what we do, the back of the Aurox spinning disk is like is mirrored. And so the, uh, the light that doesn't transmit through the disk will be reflected off the back of the disk. Now this reflective light contains the rest of the out of focus blurred information. So you can see we've got two images now. We have our left-hand image, which is the transmitted light, has our confocal signal and 50% of the out-of-focus light. And our other image, which is the reflected light, contains the rest of the out-of-focus light. So to obtain a confocal image, we simply have to subtract one from the other. Now we have to um, do an alignment step during the installation to make sure these two images are lined up correctly. And we have a calibration step when you first switch the instrument on. But essentially, this is all done on the fly um, without you having to do anything special. Um, so it's essentially a live image. So now I just want to briefly introduce you to the product that we'll be talking about in a little while. Um, so this is Unity, um, and there is a live cell imaging version called Unity Life. Um, the only difference is that the, there is an incubator um, in the Unity Life version. So Unity is designed to be an all-in-one, laser-free confocal device designed to include everything you need for your confocal imaging. So it has our such illumination spinning disk inside it. It's got a very small footprint, so it can go in any part of your lab, just in a corner of the lab or on a wet lab bench. Um, it doesn't need a dedicated microscope room. You can image in confocal and wide field modes. It's got three color channels. It runs up to about 40 frames per second. It's really, really, really easy to use, um, has low running costs and a low carbon footprint. And it's also much more affordable than buying uh, what we might call a traditional microscope with the same functionality. So just a little tour around the instrument, and I will show you in the live demo in a little while um, uh, where all these things are. Um, on the front of the instrument, um, there's a status display. Um, so in Unity Life, this will show you your CO2 concentration, your humidity, and your temperature. Um, on the rear of the instrument, we have ports for the CO2 connection. So this could be from, for example, a Tokai HIT system, an OCO lab system, or indeed just your lab supply. We also have some USB-C connections, so you can attach a monitor if you want to, or a um, portable hard drive. There's also an Ethernet connection should you wish to network the device to your um, lab network and a simple power cable. So it's really, really simple interface. There's not a whole nest of cables beside this um, instrument. There's a lift up lid. So this red part at the top is a lid. It lifts up <coughs> for um, sample loading, adding immersion oil, cleaning the instrument, for example. 
And when this lid is closed, um, it provides um, an, an integrated incubation chamber in the case of Unity Life. Um, you can see the, the red pads in this middle image. These are heater pads. There are heater pads below the sample and above the sample. So you're getting a really uniform temperature profile inside this incubator. Looking down from the top of the instrument, there is an overview lens. This is an optoelectronic lens, uh, which gives you about a 3x um, image. <clears throat> and this is taking place of the eyepieces. So obviously, this microscope doesn't have eyepieces, but this gives you a digital image looking from above the sample. Also inside the system, there's a, a PCBs containing the sensors and the heating. There's an integrated motorized XY stage. Um, the system has integrated anti-vibration. And there's also an integrated motorized Z drive, Z drive. There's one integrated objective in the system. However, I can show you at the end of the live demo how easy it is to switch between objectives. Now, as you can see, I'm, I'm listing a lot of features. If you can imagine all of these on a traditional microscope, you can see that the complexity of the system really adds up as well as the cost. Um, and you can see that all of this uh, technology is inside this one box. So as well as a spinning disk confocal, you also have an integrated computer. So you don't need an external computer to run with this system. It also has an integrated light source. This is based on the modified Cool LED P300 Ultra. And the camera is also integrated inside. So the camera in this case is two 2K by 2K scientific CMOS sensors from a manufacturer called Zymia. Just in case you're interested, the, the filter which is inside this system is based on the SEMROC triple band filter set. This is this pink or fil filter set optimized for DAPI, Bitsy and Texas, Texas Red. So you have a couple of accessories that you can choose with the system. Um, so we have different sample holders available. So depending on what, which samples you work with, you could have a multi-well plate holder, you could have slides, Petri dish. And these um, sample holders are designed to be removable, very easy to clean. Um, you also have a choice of objective lenses with the system. So at the moment, we are supplying a choice of either the Nikon 60X 1.4 NA oil immersion objective, a 20X 0.7 AA NA multi immersion objective, or 10X 0.5 NA dry. Um, now, if you do have a specific objective that you need to use for your sample, do let us know. And there, there may be some flexibility, but we found that these objectives tend to cover all bases. So um, most people um, are happy with a choice of one of those. So um, I said the system is extremely easy to use. Um, so if you attended the demo uh, yesterday of our Clarity add-on confocal, you'll see that our software is extremely different to the confocal um, control software that you might be, have used before. Um, it's not like Leica LAS or Zeiss Zen. Um, those software packages can be extremely complicated and it can be very easy to set the wrong settings or lose your way. Um, our software is designed to be very, very intuitive and easy to use. Everything is color coded. Um, and in the case of Unity, it's all based on an iPad. So it's a touchscreen iPad, um, extremely easy to use. However, even though our software is very simple, it's also very powerful. So you can um, image from above your sample or below your sample. Um, we have imaging modes and navigation modes. You could do your Z stacks, your tiling, your multi-position, your time-lapse, your multi-channel imaging, just the same as you would do with a, with a traditional type of confocal. You can image in both confocal and wide field modes, just with a toggle in the software. And all our data is exported in a universal OMI TIFF format. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can read your data into any of your favorite post-processing packages. Um, and we have a very simple data review and export mode in our software. Um, and you can also do simple post-processing within our software, should you so wish. So just a very, very brief overview of the program structure, but I will show you um, in the live demo. So we have um, a, a number of different viewing modes. Um, so we have one mode where you can choose your, your sample holder, your objective lens, also your exposure strategy. So do you want to minimize photo bleaching? Do you want to maximize speed? 
Then we have the overview, um, which looks at your sample from the top. So this helps you to find your region of interest, set up tile scans, for example. You have your imaging mode, where you set up multiple regions of interest, your Z stacks, and things like that. And then we have a protocols mode, which helps you to set up more complicated things like multiple regions of interest and time lapse settings. But again, I'll show you that when we when we connect live. So just to give you a couple of examples of, of what's possible with the laser free confocal technology, I hope that you've had time to dip into some of the talks over the last couple of days where people have used um, mainly up until now the clarity add on system. Um, for various applications, but just to show that you can use the system for anything from subcellular resolution right up to very large tissue tile scans. So this is an example of um, a, a mouse kidney, which I'm going to show you live in a second. And this is just a very large tile scan that we achieved um, in just a, a minute or so. Also, with regards to Unity Life, we've been um, really happy to work with a number of collaborators who had images. I know these videos won't show very, very well on your screens, but just to say we've done some uh, collaborations with Nina Modero and Michael Turla at Imperial College London. Um, Nina gave a really nice talk um, earlier in the conference where we were looking at live cell imaging of cancer spheroids in particular. Um, over long time scales. Um, also um, <clears throat> of great help to us were Edwin and Ricardo from Imperial College London. They provided us with various um, THP macrophage samples and other samples, again, to uh, test the sample stability over long time scales for the Unity Life project. And more recently, we've been working with Kirti Prakash and Stephanie Ray, um, and also Mike Shaw and the National Physics Laboratory. And um, we've just started this project, so we're hoping to work with them in more detail over the coming months, on, again, on, mainly on live cell imaging. So at this point, um, I'm quite happy to answer any questions about the theory or the history of AUROCs. Um, and then it will take us a few minutes just to um, move my audio visual system over to the instrument itself. So we'll have to take a, a, a very, very short pause while we do that. And then I'll rejoin you to show the instrument um, working live. Um, as you can see in this picture, um, the instrument that you're about to see is extremely compact. It's designed to sit on the, wet, on the bench in the wet lab um, or in the corner of a core facility or wherever you have any space. It doesn't need an optical table. It doesn't need a dark room. Um, it, it's a, a really a fully enclosed, um, uh, self-contained instrument. So I will turn off my audio and video just for a second, and then I will rejoin you shortly. Yes, as Lee said, this, this laptop is just so I can see myself, um, and this laptop was the one I was on just now. So what we're looking at is this instrument here. So this is Unity. It's a self-contained box. Um, with everything you need for your laser-free confocal um, experiments. And it's all being run by this iPad. So I'm just going to give you a quick tour of the hardware. And then what we'll do is we'll show you um, a data acquisition using the iPad, which means we need to swap again a little bit. Um, so as you can see, it's really, really compact. Um, everything is inside this box, including the computer. Um, and the light source and the camera. Um, as you can see, we've got our nice lid. So when this is closed, this acts as a self-enclosed incubator and also excludes light from your experiment. So you don't need a dedicated um, darkroom. Um, this is the sample stage where the, the, the sample holder is just sitting in here. I'll just grab one for you. So this is what the sample holder looks like. Um, so we have one for two slides. We have one for a multi-well plate. And you'll see on, on this um, sample holder that we have a number of magnets. So these magnets are helping to locate the sample holder into the microscope stage. Um, as you can see, these red regions on here, these are the pads that are providing the heating. We have um, heating pads in the um, base of the incubator as well as 
in the lid. So we're, we're heating um, really uniformly. Um, and this part here is really important. So this is a glass plate that the sample holder is resting on. So this is providing us with um, mechanical stability as well as thermal stability. So the sample is always resting on here and being moved around a little bit like a hockey puck. Um, this is really important. You, you'll know on traditional microscope stages, they work more as a cantilever. And so over time, you can get drift. Um, so you have to really worry about your autofocus. You have to worry about um, your sample drifting over time. Whereas in the case of Unity, it's, it's always resting on this plate, so it shouldn't move. So if you're doing long time-lapse experiments, for example, then you'll, you'll find that your, your sample is very stable. Um, above here um, is the um, optoelectronic lens that's looking from above your sample. So this is taking place of the eyepieces. Um, and this gives you that um, three times approximately view of your sample. And we'll see that when we go onto the iPad. Um, underneath, we have the objective lens. So at the moment, we have a 60x 1.4 NA oil immersion objective inserted in the system. And I'll show you right at the end, if you're interested, how easy it is to um, add and remove the objective. On the front, there's a status window that's um, at the moment telling us our CO2 um, humidity and temperature. So we don't have any CO2 connected, so it's a really low number at the moment. Um, and it's just really reading the temperature of the laboratory, which is um, quite hot today, surprisingly. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, inside this box, we have integrated computer, we have the motorized Z, we have the light source, we have the spinning disk, we have everything you need. You have the filter set. Um, so you don't need any peripheral accessories apart from this one box. And on the rear, you have, as I say, the network cable, power cable, and the USB cables, as well as your CO2 connections. Um, so if anyone has any questions about the hardware in general, then, then let me know. And if, if there are no questions, then we'll move on to showing you um, how the system works on the iPad. OK, so this is the... Uh, Unity control software. So that's the one that's running on this iPad connected to this instrument. Um, so what we have here um, is the navigation screen. So um, in the navigation screen, we can choose our sample holder. And hopefully, you'll be able to see my gestures as I touch the, the iPad screen. So I've put two fingers on the screen. And I'm just going to swipe across. And it's going to um, get me to a different sample holder. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Um, sorry, I was too slow. Um, so here's the multi-well plate. Here's the Petri dish holder. Um, so if anyone can't see my fingers touching the screen, then do let me know. In this um, uh, view as well, uh, we have what we call exposure strategy on the right-hand side. So here, if I click on these different settings, um, we can choose the way that our exposure time and intensity changes as we um, increase the toggles that I'll show you later in the in the software. We're just going to go for imaging as fast as we can. But if you had a sample, for example, that bleached very quickly, then we have a mode that will um, treat the illuminator in a slightly different way to um, uh, stop your sample bleaching or um, exhibiting phototoxicity. At the bottom as well, we can choose which objective we have. Um, installed in the system just by one click. Okay, so at the moment we have the 60X 1.4 NA oil um, installed in the system. So that's the navigation mode, not very interesting. Um, now if I swipe up, um, we, we start seeing our sample. So as I say, this is a, a mouse kidney sample. I showed it in the, um, in the presentation. So this is the overview looking from above our sample. So as you can see, we have a four millimeter by four millimeter field of view here. So it's really easy for me to just touch the screen, drag across, and I can navigate around my sample extremely easily to find my, my field of view that I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag. You can see in the middle, there's a small square, like a target. And this is the field of view of the objective lens that's looking from below. So I'm just going to drag my sample so that we have one of these nice glomeruli within the field of view of the objective lens. Now, in this view, we can also um, uh, use the um, Z control on the, on the left here to focus our sample. 
we can also um, turn on and off channels. So on the right hand side, we have our channel control. We can look at one channel at a time, for example. Or we could, in fact, if we needed to, we could change the exposure time um, and the lamp intensity. So let me just turn those channels back on. And what I'm going to do just here, I'm going to enter a file name for this, for this sample. So I'm just going to call it kidney. So once we've found our desired region of interest and we're happy with that, then we uh, swipe up again, two things. So now we're using the fine focus for the 60x to focus in on our sample. Now, as you can see on the right hand side, um, when I say that um, we don't need the strength of a laser for our illumination, you can see that we're using really short exposure times here. So we've, we've actually got, um, you know, 20 milliseconds exposure and like 5% lamp intensity. Um, now, for an LED light, that's, that's really, really, really low. And our system is just so light efficient that um, we, we're basically um, capturing all of the light to and from the sample. Okay, so the view that we've got here is a wide field mode. So this is as if we haven't done our subtraction. So if you remember in the talk, I said that we have our transmitted light, our reflected light, and we do a subtraction to contain our to obtain our confocal image. So to con obtain our confocal image, there's a, a, a tab just at the bottom left. At the moment, it says wide field. And if I tap on that, it will go into sectioning mode. And as you can see, if I go just back and forth so you can see that effect, I'll go back to the wide field image. So this is really useful for finding your sample, navigating around your sample, especially if it's very weak. And then just click in the software and we, we start doing that subtraction. Um, so as you see, we really reject the out of focus light really efficiently. Now in this mode, again, I can use my finger just to move the XY stage around, should I want, just by dragging. Um, and quite importantly at this point, um, we see an image on the screen here, but this is not, the, the um, sample is not being illuminated at the moment. So we only snap an image when we do something to the software. So if I move the stage, then it will snap an image to refresh. So um, we're really protecting your sample. We're not illuminating it unless we need to. So there are a few controls in this imaging mode, as we call it. Um, first of all, we have the, the Z control on the left, so we can focus in on our sample and focus through it. Um, and I'll use that to set up a Z stack in a second. You've already seen the wide field versus sectioning mode. Um, on the right hand side, we have our exposure time settings and lamp intensity settings. And depending on the image, um, the exposure strategy you used um, will depend what happens when you use these controls. So, if I, for example, I just control this uh, Fitzy channel. Um, so I'm just pressing my thumb um, on, on the numbers on the right hand side and then I can move my thumb up and down. And I hope you can see that as I move up and down, the, the little arrow becomes colored in more, either at the bottom or at the top. Now, this is acting like a histogram to guide you on where would be your optimum exposure time um, and your optimum intensity. Um, so, for example, here we've got our a DAPI channel is a little bit more colored in at the bottom. So it's a little bit underexposed, but I'm not too worried for the DAPI channel. And the Fitzy channel is extremely bright, even with just 4% lamp intensity. And I know that these glomeruli are very, very bright indeed. So we've seen that we can um, add our um, file name. So this, this will give an overall file name for your data set on the right hand side. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you how to set up three discrete regions of interest. So there are a number of these glomeruli on our, on our um, sample. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how quickly we can do that. So for each region of interest, I'm going to set up a, a, a Z stack and give it a name. So first of all, I'm going to set up the Z stack for this glomerulus. So to do that, I'm just going to use the focus wheel on the left to navigate to the bottom of my sample. And I click on this bottom number. Then I'm going to navigate to the top of our sample. and click on the top number. So it's just like a traditional confocal, 
All right, so now we have our Z range um, uh, sorted out. So I can just move up and down within that Z range. So I've set the Z stack. Now I'm going to give it a name. So up on the top left, we can give it a, a region of interest name. So I'm going to call it Glomerulus1 and click return. Now we've got that region of interest set up with, the diff with its own exposure times, its own Z um, settings. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to swipe right on the green arrows on the top left to capture that region of interest. And you'll see it kind of gets sucked into the bottom of the application, which gives you a clue as to where you might want to go after we've set up the discrete regions of interest. Now, at this point, I could navigate around manually in the 60x mode to find another region of interest I want. However, we, we do have this really, really useful um, navigation mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swipe to the our overview mode here. I'm going to find another glomerulus in a different area. So I'm going to choose this one. And then I'm going to swipe back again to our imaging mode. So there's our glomerulus. I'll go ahead and set up another Z stack. So I'm going to go to the top this time, set the top, navigate down to the bottom. So you can see that you could get quite quick at this with, um, with a little bit of practice. So that's my second Z stack set up. I'm actually going to use the same exposure time settings, but you could change them if you wanted to. And then I'm going to go ahead and call this glomerulus 2. So that's our second region of interest. And then I'm going to capture that region of interest into our um, magic box at the bottom of this application. Then I'm going to do one more repeat. So I'm going to find another one. So let's say this one over here. OK, I didn't quite get that right, but there he is. And set up the Z stack again. OK, so what I've done then is I've set up three discrete glomeruli. I'll just give that one a name, glomerulus three. All right, and then capture that region of interest. So I've got three regions of interest. Well, uh, where did they go? They went down to the bottom of this application if you, if you saw them disappear. So if I then swipe again, this takes us into what we call our protocols mode. So this gives us a, di a different level. So you could have just done one region of interest and acquired your Z stack from there, but we wanted three. So here, if I swipe um, left and right, we can swipe between the regions of interest. And at this point, if I realize that I've made a mistake um, or if my sample had drifted or perhaps the cell isn't as good as we thought, I can always delete, rename, um, a, a region of interest. We can edit them here. We can also change the Z stack. We could change anything before you click acquire. Okay, so you have full control here. If you wanted to, at this point, you can set up a time lapse. So if we go to the top left and click here, then we have our time lapse settings. So we can set duration, for example, and we can set time interval. Okay. I'm not going to do that right now, but those controls are up there should you want them. So for this exercise, we've set three regions of interest, which we can see here. And now I'm going to acquire the data. So you can see the speed at which the system will acquire. So to do that, there are two arrows on the right hand side. And I'm just going to swipe left on that and it's going to acquire the data. So as you can see, it's really, really, really fast. So it's acquiring three color confocal Z stacks in just a few seconds per region of interest. Um, so it's doing 60 slices and it's doing um, a step size of 0.3 microns, which is around Nyquist sampling for this objective lens. OK, and then we're finished. So once we're there, um, we can go back into live mode, we can carry on, um, do some more regions of interest. Um, as I said, if you wanted to, you could just click on acquire in this window just to do one data set if you didn't want multiple regions of interest. Um, so that's a very, very brief overview. I'll just show you one more um, function that's within the Unity software. Um, if you wanted to do a tile scan, for example, 
Um, so within the Unity software, it's really, really easy to set up a tile scan. You come back into your navigation mode, um, work out where you want to be on your sample. So maybe we want to go somewhere completely different. Um, let's go here. So if we wanted to set up a tile scan here, there's a toggle just on the bottom right. So if I click on that, it will activate our tile scan acquisition. And if I just place my finger on the screen and hold it and then drag a box and then release, that will create our tiles for us. So then when we go into our acquisition, that will um, capture our tile scan with the optimum overlap to stitch in, say, Fiji or Image J. Um, so it's really, really, really easy to set up tile scans and multiple regions of interest, should you wish. So that's what I wanted to show you for the sort of uh, canned demo, as it were. Um, so we'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I can always show you um, some more detail about any of the instrumentation, um, should you want to see something again. Um, so maybe Lee can help me out with letting me know if any questions come into the chat box. Um, feel, feel free to ask me anything about the hardware or the software, um, or I can show you any more functionality that you want to see. We've chosen by default, so when you choose your objective lens, so in this case we've cho chosen the 60 times 1.4 NA oil lens, and by default, if you look at the bottom left-hand side of the um, iPad app, there's this um, orange uh, triangle, so I'll just put my finger on it, it's where we chose from wide field to sectioning. Now this is chosen to be 0.3 micron steps, which is um, the, the optimum sampling really, if you wanted to do um, uh, Nyquist sampling or thereabouts. Now, if you wanted to do finer step sizes and oversample a little bit, for example, if you wanted to do deconvolution, then if I put my thumb on this, um, the controller will pop out. So this is the way all of our controls work. So you put your finger or your thumb on the area, and then you can move up and down. And as you can see there, um, hopefully it shows up that the top half of the arrow is now um, colored in, showing 1.5 micron steps. Um, so that means that we're under sampling. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, under sampling. Um, so that's if you've got a really thick sample and you want to just um, step through really fast and you're not too worried about your actual resolution. And then if I click on it again, bring my finger down, you can see that you can go down to 0 0.03 micron steps if you wanted to oversample for your um, deconvolution algorithms and things like that. But when it's colored in completely, then that's the sort of default that we recommend for Nyquist. While we're waiting, I can maybe get that tile scan running um, just to show you how it works. Maybe not quite such a big one, but I'll show you how quickly it will um, achieve a tile scan. So in the in the overview mode, we set up just drag and drop a box around where you want to image. And then um, so here we've got in the bottom right, we've got nine tiles set up and then I can literally just click acquire there and it will go ahead and capture our tile scan for us. And I think it might collect, capture the ROI that I collected as well. Um, but you can see that you know, you can set up experiments extremely quickly, extremely simply, but you do have access to quite advanced protocols um, behind the scenes. Um, so we're taking care of a lot of settings for you behind the scenes, but you can access it all um, to change it to optimize your experiment. Have I? Oh, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me talking? Okay. We thought we were having some problem with audio. Okay. Well, I think that's all I needed to show you on the iPad. Um, so we can go back to the, the video. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yes, it is possible. Yeah, I skimmed over it very briefly. But once this data set's finished, maybe we can... Uh, we can show that functionality. Um, so it's just doing this, this tile scan that I set going just to have something to look at, which is nice. Okay, so um, yeah, so for time-lapse, um, what you do is you, you come up into your 
protocols mode. So you remember there are these four modes stacked on top of one another. So we have the sample holder mode, which is the navigation mode. Then we have the overview mode, which is the uh, uh, lens looking from the top of the sample. We have our imaging mode, which I was just in. And this is our protocols mode. So this is where we have our, our multiple um, regions of interest still. Um, so in this area, um, this is where we can uh, set up um, our time lapse. So this is on the top left hand corner. Uh, so if I just um, put my thumb again onto that, um, onto that arrow, then that activates the time lapse. Um, if I put my thumb on it again, then the controller will pop out. So it's a little bit like changing the sectioning, um, that you put your finger or thumb on it, the controller will pop out, and then I'm just going to move my thumb up to change the duration of your experiment. And you can do quite long experiments if you want to, um, or put it down. And then if I release my thumb, put it back on, Release my thumb, put it back on. It's hard to do, it's hard to talk and do this at the same time. Then that changes your interval. So this is how um, the interval between your data captures. So again, we can change that to maybe up to an hour or down to a few seconds, depending on what you want. So when you've set up that your time lapse settings, that will be saved in this protocol. Um, so in this protocol, we could do if we wanted to a combination of tile scans by turning it on a combination of our three regions of interest that we saved, and they would all have their own Z range and their own exposure time settings. And we could combine all of that with a time lapse. Um, so you could get quite a complicated experimental protocol depending on your sample and what you need. Um, so yeah, this, this is the view where you, you implement your, your time lapse settings, tile scans, and multiple regions of interest. See if you do want a one-on-one -on -one remote demo, um, obviously, we'd love to come to your lab, but with the COVID restrictions, it's not possible at the moment. But we're happy to do a remote demo where you can ask more in-depth questions and we can even try your own samples. So do get in touch with us if you want to have a more detailed chat about Unity. But thank you very much for attending and for, for giving us your time this afternoon and hope to see you in session four.